we go. Alrighty, hello and welcome to week seven of Cycle, Sync, and Chisel. This week, we will be discussing your pathways of elimination. Okay, um, so some of our objectives for this week, we're gonna just quickly review the symptoms that you may be experiencing if you did have any congestion in your pathways of elimination. What are the four pathways of elimination? So identifying those organs. We will discuss the phases of detoxification. Um, and I will be very um, straightforward that I've seen it listed as a few different ways. So I'm going to describe it in a way that makes sense to me. I'm sure down the road, I will go back and edit that. Um, but <clears throat> I've heard it listed as there are three phases. I've heard it listed as four phases. Um, and so anyways, we'll, we'll go back over that. I'm sure at some point in revisions down the road, uh, we'll talk about the nutrients that it needed, that your body needs, you need to physically ingest in order to support these pathways. We'll break down the key components of um, your elimination system, right? So we talk heavily about the liver, but this piece right here specifically, we'll be talking a little bit more, giving some details about the large intestine, your skin and your lymphatics um, system. And then we'll just do a slight review of the Woman Code Four Day Cleanse and when you would want to incorporate it, if you're gonna go ahead and incorporate it. I feel very wrong just reposting her cleanse because that's, that's her information. Um, I provide links to a free PDF with the full content of the cleanse. It just felt very wrong to copy it all and bring it on over. So I'll, I'll link that for you. Um, as a reminder, GI and skin issues are related to hormones almost all the time. We can just ba basically guarantee that if we're having GI issues or skin issues, that something is hormonally off. Um, again, it all goes full circle, right? We're misinformed. We are desensitized to what's going on in our body. And it's all this like, I don't want to be like a conspiracy theorist, right? But it's like, it's a, it's a cycle that bigger corporations really feed off of us with, right? If they don't know what's going on, we can keep telling them that it's this and this and this, when really it's like, it's your hormones. So there's that. When our pathways get congested, the body can't get rid of toxins nor metabolic waste. Toxins would be your endocrine disruptors, um, chemicals we put on our skin, that would be an endocrine disruptor, perfumes, fragrances, all of those different things. Metabolic waste could be just like the, the literal like waste products of what's happening within your body, um, as well as the excess or the uh, residue left over from the hormones that you do need, right? We wanna be able to get rid of that. Um, would we add in the topics that we've already talked about? So uh, dysregulated blood sugar and adrenals that are just like all out of whack, we will end up, guarantee it, we will end up with some type of issue within our pathways of elimination. Something is going to get congested, okay? These are some signs, you've seen this list before, that you've got some congestion going on in your pathways. So IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, oily skin, any bloating or water retention. Again, we're told that that's totally normal and it's not. Acne, we're told that that's normal. It's unpleasant, but we're told it's normal. And some people get it, some people don't. I would like to really fully believe that it's not normal and it is preventable. Dandruff, eczema, hair loss, constipation. The opposite of that, loose stools or diarrhea. Body odor, all of a sudden, like if your pits really stink one day, that's gonna be a sign that something got a little backed up, a little clogged. And then night sweats. So the organs of elimination are going to be your liver, your large intestine, your skin, and your lymphatic system. This picture in the background here is your lymphatic system. And obviously we can't see the full image there, but it, it's wild. It, it's like a web that covers your whole body. Okay, so when we talk about detoxification, there are four phases. Again, this is where sometimes you'll see it written as three phases, but I, I would like to think of it as four. 
Um, so phase in, phases one and two all happen in your liver. From there, phase three is going to begin in the large intestine. And phase four would be the excretion of whatever, and we'll get into these details, but whatever the liver and large intestine couldn't really handle, the body is going to try to excrete that through either the lymphatic system, which I did not write there, or the skin, right? So either through sweat or through the lymphatic system. In phase one, your liver breaks down toxins into water soluble elements. So toxins, including hormones, are going to be fat soluble. The reason uh, hormones are fat soluble is because our body wants them to stick around, you know, for, for an extended period of time so that they can do the duties that they're supposed to do, right? If they were water soluble, we would just be basically peeing them out, right? So hormones have to be fat soluble. Toxins tend to be fat soluble. Um, so the liver is going to break those down into water soluble elements and <clears throat> those water soluble elements become free radicals. I know we've all heard of that term free radicals. So the, the toxins that we're exposed to that we ingest are hormones when they've been you know, done their duty, whatever's remaining. These are converted via the liver along with the nutrients listed here into free radicals. So the liver has to have vitamin C, flavonoids, B vitamins, amino acids, and glutathione in order to take these toxins and hormones and break them into water soluble free radicals. Then we want phase two to happen as quickly as possible because we don't want these free radicals floating around in our system. They're there, but we want them to be, we want this elimination system to be moving the way it's supposed to be moving. So in phase two, we're still in the liver. That free radical or those free radicals are combined with selenium and amino acids, maybe also some choline and sulfur. Um, and that's going to make these free radicals harmless and allow them to be excreted via phase three, which is going to be bringing them to the large intestine or could go, you know, there's a couple pieces here, right? So you could have bile and bowel movements or you could have kidneys and urine. So those are two, you either end up with excretion via this phase, via this channel through bowel movement or urine, okay? Um, in order to support this phase, you need adequate water. You have to have enough water in your system for things to flow. You're gonna be wanting to eat bitter foods like artichoke and dandelion, um, not all the time, but they definitely help. And then you also need fiber. And we'll get into more details about these specific nutrients. Um, we'll have a full list of kind of like what these things include. Um, in phase four, what hasn't been excreted, so what the liver and the large intestine couldn't take care of, it has it, the body has a chance to do so via the skin and through the release of sweat. Um, I like to consider the lymphatic system as this like constant sweeper. It's like swiffering, right? It's just constantly swiffering. And it, it's, it's going around bringing, around, bringing in, taking metabolic waste, toxins, dead skin cells, dead cells. Let me back that up, not dead skin cells, dead cells um, and any excess fluid. And it's going to bring it to the bloodstream so that it has a chance to try to go back to the liver and try to go through the large intestine, right? So again, the, the, it's like the lymphatic system is doing the final sweeps, trying to see what else, what, else, what didn't make it through the first time and how can I get it back to the liver so that we can start phase one, phase two, and eventually phase three. Um, the best way to support phase four, so your skin and your lymphatic system is going to be work on, you know, working on healing any GI congestion um, and we'll also talk about other ways to support these systems, but um, exercise, sleep, reduce stress, those things all help as well. In an absolutely perfect scenario, this is a breakdown of how the system should be working. So the liver takes a fat soluble toxin or hormone and makes it water soluble via nutrients like selenium, amino acids, vitamins B, C, and glutathione. Those all exist in your liver, but you need to get them through your diet. 
This now water soluble product is brought to the gallbladder where it mixes with bile and then heads to the large intestine to eventually leave the body. You need to have the adequate amounts of these nutrients within the liver for this process to start. And you also need adequate amounts of dietary fiber located within your large intestine in order to bind with waste and make sure it leaves the body. If we do not have enough fiber, this elimination process becomes much more challenging, okay? Um, studies have shown that just taking supplements of these nutrients will not do the trick. And that's because they, in supplemental form, they are not readily bioavailable. Um, a confusing piece here, or possibly like a concerning piece, right, is that our food supply, really no matter where you're getting it from, even if it's organic, regeneratively farmed, uh, it's still most likely lacking the nutrients that it had centuries ago, right? It, just because our soils are depleted. So I would say it still does not hurt to supplement because when I say it's not readily, bio, readily bioavailable, I believe that if you were to continue to expose yourself to that supplement, it would be available. It's just not right off the bat, right? So continuing to find food sources of that nutrient, but then also perhaps supplementing with it. One, for example, that um, I see recommended actually more and more is uh, supplementation with glutathione. And again, we'll talk about food sources of that nutrient, but I have been seeing more <clears throat> research on supplementing with glutathione. Okay, so this is, this is like, if you're gonna take notes, remember you always get a copy of this um, in a PDF format, um, but this would be the stuff to like hang up on your fridge or to screenshot and have on your phone for the grocery store. Um, cause this is going to tell you exactly what to be eating. Okay. So it's a lot of information <laughs> in phase one, we're looking to support our liver, right? Cause remember phase one and phase two is going to be your liver. I guess I could have put there phase one and two, but anyways, we're looking to support our liver. So we need vitamin C. We want to be eating citrus. Um, and you'll see right here below that I say temporarily temporarily avoid grapefruit if trying to ease congestion, like, um, you know, GI congestion. And that's specifically because grapefruit has an enzyme that slows liver function. Um, so if you're trying to improve liver function, step away from grapefruit just for a little bit, just until you see an improvement. It's not forever, but it's just step away from grapefruit in the beginning. Okay. So we have citrus, um, bell peppers, especially red. Red is, I believe, the highest content of vitamin C within bell peppers. Strawberries, tomatoes, white potatoes. I hate the hate on potatoes, like specifically white potatoes. They're very good for us. So white potatoes, get your white potatoes. Uh, cruciferous vegetables. So that's going to be uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower. There are others, um, but making sure that you're getting cruciferous cruciferous, I always have a hard time with that word, vegetables. Flavonoids, I had to look up what flavonoids were. Um, flavonoids are going to be berries, red cabbage, onions, kale, parsley, apples, cherries, soybeans, citrus fruits, tea, red wine, and dark chocolate. Most of the US population gets their flavonoids from <laughs> wine and dark chocolate. Um, if you have any hormonal things going on, I would shy away from the inclusion of soybeans until you have things like more regulated, right? Um, when we are looking to improve our skin, so say we are trying to prevent aging or you know dull skin, flavonoids help the skin um, absorb vitamin C and vitamin C helps the skin retain its natural collagen, its elastin, and hyaluronic acid. Um, so like literally just like youthfulness in the skin. Um, so flavonoids are needed for the skin to absorb vitamin C, okay? B vitamins, um, you're gonna find this in meat, especially liver, seafood, poultry, eggs, dairy products, legumes, leafy greens, and seeds, specifically sunflower seeds, they have the 
highest content of B vitamins. Um, and that's due to um, them being rich in panothenic acid. It's a type of B vitamin. Um, <clears throat> okay, here's glutathione, right? So glutathione is made up of actually three amino acids, glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. You can, this is a very short list, but you could find glutathione naturally in spinach, avocados, asparagus, and okra. Interesting, the body does create its own source of glutathione, but we do still want to support it by ingesting it as well, okay? Um, glutathione is, um, again, because the body's creating it on its own, there are other ways to support it, just, um, to support it by giving it the nutrients that basically either help it not be used as much, so there's more in the body, or components that essentially make it more active, okay? So it's just different chemical reactions within the body. So if you're getting in sulfur-rich foods like beef, fish, uh, poultry, cruciferous vegetables, um, alien vegetables like garlic, shallots, onions, and then vitamin C-rich foods, there's a lot of overlap here happening, right? Um, Interesting piece again about the vitamin C and glutathione is that when we ingest vitamin C, that's helping to fight off free radicals. So it actually helps preserve some of the glutathione because glutathione would also help do that because it's necessary for the, the process, the phase one of um, detoxification in the liver, right? And that is the conversion of fat soluble to water soluble, turning them into free radicals, right? So this addition or making sure you get enough vitamin C is being shown through studies to actually kind of keep your glutathione levels more, um, more stable, like not reducing them as much. Okay. Um, a little bit more support here for the liver is going to be milk thistle. Okay. That's going to be, that has been shown to increase glutathione levels and prevent depletion. And it also helps prevent cell damage. When we talk about turmeric, we're really speaking on curcumin and that's a component within turmeric. Interesting, you probably would not be able to get enough turmeric via just the spice. Like there would probably not be a palatable <laughs> amount uh, that you'd want to eat for it to be effective. So it's suggested to do like a tincture. Okay. You could also do capsules. I know I've seen um, capsules as well. Amino acids. Um, you need amino acids. We need amino acids for protein, right? Trying to get about a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. You need a complete amino acid profile to be able to do that. Uh, you can find that in beef, eggs, poultry, um, whey protein, not a real food source, but it's a supplement. It could work. Um, and then for vegans or vegetarians, combination of rice and beans is the first one that comes to mind for me, but that does give you a complete amino acid profile. Um, another way to get amino acids, if you are vegan or vegetarian, is going to be through just a straight up amino acid supplement. Um, there are powders, there are capsules, that's all that I know of. Um, if you are shopping for really either, but specifically powders, I would be looking for any food dyes, fake sugars. Um, I would be trying to find as clean of a product as you possibly could, right? This whole supplement industry, especially in basically like the fitness industry, filled with a ton of fillers and dyes and fake sugars, all of which we know are not great for us. And um, it's really easy to turn a blind eye to it. But if we're going down this path of trying to be as mindful and as aware as we can of what's going into our body, then it is worth slowing down and taking a look. I do know for a matter of fact that ProMix has an amino acid supplement, uh, a powder, a drinkable powder. Every time I've gone to get it, they have been out, um, but they use zero artificial ingredients. Um, so I highly support ProMix. I am an ambassador for them. So um, if you are interested in buying any ProMix, I can give you a discount code and you'd get 10% off, but um, I don't even know if they have their amino acid powder, but you could also sign up for their wait list. They do have that. Um, additional support for your liver, make sure you're getting enough sleep, make sure you're moving your body, 
and then also reduce alcohol, okay? Doesn't say cut out, but reduce, right? Um, so this should really say phase three, I'm seeing right now, but phase three support is gonna be more targeted to your gut. So think your large intestine, um, let's just say specifically large intestine. So choline, liver, egg yolks, red meat, salmon, cod, tilapia, chicken breast, and your one vegetarian vegan source would be legumes, okay? Selenium, beef, chicken, fish, organ meats, cottage cheese, brown rice, Brazil nuts. Love Brazil nuts. Great source of selenium. Um, we already talked about amino acids, so sources of amino acids we just covered. And then we also did briefly touch on sulfur, but let's go back real quick just to review here. Um, sulfur rich foods would be beef, fish, poultry, and your cruciferous vegetables, as well as things like garlic, shallots, and onions, okay? How would you support your skin and lymphatic system? You would want to be moving your body. You wanna keep circulating, right? You wanna keep your circulation up. You can dry brush. You wanna make sure you're drinking adequate amounts of water, but make sure it's also filtered and clean. You wanna absolutely reduce your exposure to toxins. Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail about that. So I'm not gonna go there yet. Um, and you of course wanna make sure you're doing everything that you can to get your gut in order, okay? Constipation, what's the deal with constipation? So asking yourself, are you pooping within 20 minutes of waking? I used to think it was 30 minutes, but it is actually 20 minutes. You should be having a bowel minute, a bowel movement within 20 minutes of waking. There are, it's so funny as like, I've been doing the research. I don't know if I was like nervous or what, but um, there was like a solid couple of days where I'd wake up to teach and I wake up like an hour at the latest, but I try to wake up an hour and a half to two hours prior to teaching. Um, and there was like five days where I was up and nothing, nothing would happen until after class. So clearly I had something going on. There was some, some bit of congestion was happening within my system. Um, chronobiology, remember, is the study of uh, basically like each organs or each organs like timing each organ cycle it's rhythm okay and it has us understanding the liver does a deep cleanse daily ideally it should be doing a deep cleanse daily from about 3 p.m to 3 a.m and so that's about a 12 hour window for your liver to be doing like a cleaning of the house and to be getting things like in order for them to leave the body right? So when you wake up, if that bowel movement isn't happening within 20 minutes, you might want to first start to look at your liver. Like how can you improve the support you provide your liver, right? Um, it could be your large intestine, but I would start with your liver. Make sure you're going through ways to support your liver, getting those nutrients, right? It could be as simple as just missing some nutrients and then things start flowing again. Um, the issue with constipation, besides it being uncomfortable and annoying, is that your large intestine is osmotic in nature, which means things can permeate in and out. They can flow in and out of the, the membrane of your large intestine. This is an issue because when we're constipated, things are like they're sitting, right? And so they're, 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 they could be flowing in and out of the, the large intestine if they're flowing out of the large intestine, remember there's, there's toxins trying to leave your body. They're gonna go back into your bloodstream and now they're going to continue to circulate throughout the rest of your body. Um, this is something that has to be remedied, right? The moment you know you're constipated, you need to try to fix it because you, you don't want that shit literally sitting in you. You want those toxins out of you. Um, an example of, you know, what could happen if we're not being careful with this is we'll have excess estrogen floating around. So if we're somebody who's experiencing bloating, right? Again, we're told that's normal. Uh, PMS, we're told that's normal. Painful periods, we're told that's normal. Um, fertility issues, low libido, 
that could all be signs that you have too much estrogen, estrogen dominance, right? And it could be a simple fix of making sure you're getting the nutrients that your body needs in order for these phases of detoxification to happen. Okay, so if you know we're experiencing, say, constipation, some of this would be important for us to to all to acknowledge and to understand. We need to be eating foods that support our liver. Okay. High quality protein for amino acids. Um, and again, we discussed this, but uh, vegetarians and vegans can supplement with a powdered form or a capsule form, okay? If you're not getting enough through food sources. We should be eating glutathione rich foods like carrots. This is more of an extensive list than earlier, but carrots, broccoli, avocado, spinach, apple, asparagus, and melon. And we also need to be making sure that we're getting selenium rich foods like oats and Brazil nuts. And interesting enough, cilantro. I know that's a tough one for some people, but cilantro contains linalool. It, and that's a compound that literally cleans the liver. And I'm laughing right now because I'm thinking some people think cilantro tastes like soap. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if, yeah, it's just funny. I wonder if it's something with this compound uh, and having a certain chromosome or something that makes it taste like soap, but it's literally cleaning your liver. So maybe that's why it tastes like soap. Um, if you're having congestion in the, the large intestine, you want to be making sure that like, check out your fiber, how much fiber are you getting on a daily basis? We want this to be soluble fiber. Um, and this is a quite extensive list of sources of soluble fiber. But I'll just name a few here. We have oats, um, nuts and seeds. I would be mindful of your intake of nuts and seeds. Those are super uh, dense calorie wise and so easy to overconsume. They're not bad, but just be mindful of how much you're getting there. Um, plenty of beans, lentils, we have peas. Um, repetition here, but sunflower seeds are listed here as well. So um, you'd be getting B vitamins and a source of soluble fiber. Um, yeah, so you can read that list yourself. But another thing to do to, to help fix any congestion that you're having, look at your poop. What does it look like? In a perfect scenario, it should be like medium brown, uh, curved, smooth, and should briefly float, right? That's a perfect poop. If it's not that, then there's my, might be something going on in the large intestine. There might be some, some slowness going on, okay? Um, some people think that colonics are like the best thing in the world. Truth is, it's really just a quick fix. It's, it's like a little Band-Aid um, and it can actually upset your, your flora, your gut flora, your, your gut microbiome. So just like douching, we don't recommend douching anymore. I would not recommend a colonic. Um, if you do have constipation and you need, you know, assistance, you need some relief, you could do an enema. I feel like that's very, very different than a colonic. Um, and you could also try Oxy. I will share it in the email. There's a capsule of oxygenated something that does work very well. Okay. Very natural and um, not to be used all the time, but can help in instances where you do need a little assistance. Again, the real thing that you need to be doing though, or the more long-term thing that needs to be happening is we need to address like what is going on, why is this happening? And it's like a bit of detective work. Your skin and lymphatic system. So your skin is the largest organ of your body and it also is the largest organ of elimination, right? Because you could sweat everywhere. Your skin is going to handle anything that the liver and the large intestine couldn't eliminate, and it's going to do so through sweat. Um, if you have symptoms and they're showing up on your skin, I mean, that's the last place that your symptoms will show up if you're having some issues within your pathways of elimination. So when things are showing up on your skin, you know that you've been kind of not seeing, not tuning in taking no blame, but not realizing that something's not going on the way it should be within your gut, okay? If it's on the skin, it's been going on for a while. And that's like the body's final 
cry out of like, hey, slow down, help me out. Um, if you, you know, you've got some skin issues, if you decongest the liver and the large intestine, your skin issues will most likely clear up. And when we're talking about skin issues, again, it was things like acne, you could have rosacea, um, eczema, right? Those types of things. Again, this doesn't fully, I can't get the full body um, on these slides, but this is just um, a brief look into the extent of the lymphatic system, which we'll talk about here in a second. I mean, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, all over the body. Um, the lymphatic system is made up of organs, nodes, ducts, and vessels, and those are going to produce and transport lymph. And lymph is a fluid made up of white blood cells. Um, your lymphatic system is, you probably know this, but it's a huge player in your immune system, but also the detoxification process, right? We call it kind of the sweeper, the swiffer. That's what I was calling it, the swiffer. Um, and here we are talking about its swiffing capabilities. Uh, it collects metabolic waste, toxins, dead cells, and excess fluid from your organs, places them into the bloodstream to be brought to the liver and large intestine. Normally, the lymphatic system sends white blood cells to steer away any germs or invaders to help prevent infections. Um, if your lymphatic system becomes congested, your body is also going to become congested. And when that happens, the system kind of flips. And so instead of sending out white blood cells to, you know, to steer away germs and invaders, it attracts, the lymph attracts germs and invaders and transports them into the bloodstream. And then that circulates throughout your body, which increases your risk for infection, right? So that is not good. And we want to prioritize making sure that our lymphatic system is working the way that it should be. Um, when we think of congested lymphatic system, congested body, think of allergies, chronic sinusitis, sinusitis um, inflammation, right? Chronic inflammation, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, right? These are, these are signs of a congested lymphatic system. When we are looking at issues on the skin, some things that we could be doing to help improve these is one, very important, clear any congestion in your, any congestion in your gut. Try your best, right? Try to go through some of these protocols. Um, maybe go through the four-day cleanse that I'll link here at the end. Um, but see if you can make any improvements to your gut. That's where it's got to start because that's where the issue is coming from. So you've got to heal from the inside before the outside starts to heal, okay? When you take a shower, if you alternate between hot and cold water, or you could say warm and cold water, you're going to um, help your cells, your skin constrict and expand. Uh, yes, constrict and expand, yes. <laughs> um, and that's going to basically for like, it one increases circulation, so that's good for your lymphatic system as well. Um, but it can force toxins out of your skin. I would say the same is going to be true for it's listed here as sauna, steam, hot baths, uh, but also um, expose. I want to say exposure therapy, but that's not what I'm thinking of right now. Um, ice and heat is what I'm thinking of. Um, so getting into a, an ice bath for three to four minutes and then putting yourself into a sauna for at least 20 minutes and doing that for like three cycles, that would also have a profound effect on, on your skin. Um, you can also, it's recommended to exfoliate a couple times a week. Um, this is just gonna simply help remove dead skin cells and, and let your pores, I wanna say breathe, but you know, give them easier access to, to sweat. And then of course, dry brushing. Dry brushing is not only going to be good for essentially what we just spoke on, the exfoliation, uh, but it will also increase circulation and it aids in the lymphatic system, right? Remember when we dry brush, we want to do long, quick strokes. They can be as rough as you want them to be. They don't have to be super light. We want to be moving the fluid. 
up towards the heart. So no matter where you're brushing, you want to be brushing towards your heart. When is the best time to be dry brushing? I don't want to say best, but most important time when we're ovulating. Um, and here we'll go into some remedies for your lymphatic system. So again, if you feel congested in the lymphatic system, say you're clogged up or anything like that, allergies are flaring up, here are some things that could possibly help. So I love this one, jump and dance. Just like throughout the day, get up and jump. Uh, Elisa recommends getting like a little mini tramp and just jumping on the tramp. I've actually you know, heard of this for, um, for many different practices, not just for this, but get a little trampoline and start jumping a couple of times throughout the day, especially if you sit in a desk, get up and jump. Don't have a trampoline, get up and dance. Just move your body, shake it. The importance of that is that it literally gives a gentle massage of lymph through your lymphatic system. Um, and so it, it's sending the fluid to the lymph nodes. It's, it's helping to facilitate the process that we want to have happen, okay? You wanna keep your groin and your armpits free of toxins. So we've heard, you know, find um, aluminum free deodorant for years now. We also know now we want to make sure it's fragrance free. Does that mean it can't have essential oils? No, essential oils are very, very different than man-made manufactured fragrance. Those are very, very different. Um, one area of concern that I know that I'm currently debating is period underwear. So period underwear, the original brand that I was purchasing, I know for a fact had one of the endocrine disruptors on it. Um, I forget the name of that endocrine disruptor at this time, but it's basically a um, non-stick element. And it's literally sitting up against a, a super, you know, mucous membrane where things just can so easily pass that, pass through that membrane. Um, so I do believe I've heard that there are toxic, toxin-free period underwear. Um, I've yet to come across a pair that I like. So if you are um, looking for some, you can find some, please let me know. Um, but we want to make sure that we're keeping those areas specifically free of toxins. I keep talking about this on Instagram, but when you get home, take your bra off. Um, I never consider myself wearing a bra because I'm always in tank tops that I personally don't feel are super restrictive. But if I wasn't doing this call, I probably would not have this top on because it is, it's got a built in like sports bra to it. Um, but when we are home, we should, you know, consider taking off anything that's restrictive. That could be your workout pants, your running shorts, um, Socks, if you're wearing socks and every time you take off your socks, you've got a line around your ankles, then like take them off, be barefoot, be completely barefoot in your home. Bras, um, tight jeans. Oh my goodness, that just gives me like terror thinking about tight jeans, but like take your tight jeans off whenever you can. <laughs> um, all right, okay. And then the you know final piece with lymphatic is support your system through dry brushing. You can also, um, that's a repeat slide. We've already done this one. <laughs> okay, here we go. Final piece. Um, what if you're experiencing stubborn weight, right? So you've been trying for a while to um, lose some weight and doing it in a really like smart, educated way, not crash dieting, not yo-yoing, not over-exercising, like really going around about it in a, a, a mindful way. Um, it could be because of a hormonal issue that is compromising your liver function. And so it, it, bear with me as we break this down, but it, it does make sense that this could be happening. So if your liver isn't working efficiently, it might not be able to take those fat soluble toxins or hormones and convert them into water soluble. And if it can't do that, it will sometimes send it to your fat cells to be stored. Okay. If it's in the fat cells, the body knows they're toxins. So it's like, we're not going to utilize them through the process of lipolysis. Um, that's the breakdown of fat and 
basically the breaking it down so that you can use it as energy. We don't want to touch these fat cells because those are toxins. Those, those actually have toxins in there. The body's at least that, you know, the body is very smart and it doesn't want to touch those. It won't touch those until your liver is working pro uh, properly. So again, incentive, if you've got stubborn weight that you just like can't seem to shed, focus on supporting your liver. See if that helps. Reviewing again, make sure you're getting enough vitamins A, B, and C. You're getting enough glutathione. You're getting sulfur-rich foods, okay? Typo, I hate typos. I see a typo right now. Um, you wanna make sure you're including lemons and oranges. Remember, skip grapefruit for a little bit if you're trying to like work on your liver. And then also caraway and dill. So you can add that to like salads, right? Caraway and dill. Um, but those are gonna be, again, some ways to support your liver. It's all coming, like you gotta support your liver, you gotta support your large intestine. The skin and lymphatics should kind of heal and be good if you focus on those two areas, okay? Um, before we wrap up and go over some homework, cool, it will, it will work. Um, so again, I didn't want to directly like copy and paste her protocol, her four day cleanse, um, her being Lisa Vitti, the author of Woman Code. Um, so I've linked them and you can check it out for yourself. But um, this blogger, the minimalist baker, she had a really nice review on it. She was experiencing some um, hormonal acne and she has done the cleanse twice and she noticed a, a, a big difference but with both of those cleanses in her skin. Um, the, let's go here to see some of the benefits of this protocol. So you're gonna improve your skin. Your, again, the whole point of this is to help support your GI system, right? If it's not running the way it should be, then your hormones also aren't gonna be running the way that they should be. So if you can help reset it, and yes, this is a four day cleanse. You can't just go back to eating, you know, the ways that you were once this cleanse is over. You need to educate yourself and to start to incorporate, not copy the cleanse for a lifetime, but to like really look at what you're eating to, to with every meal, make sure you're supporting your system, right? Um, mood is going to improve. You could, I would say not in four days, but you could change your body composition because maybe perhaps after four days of doing this cleanse, which you're eating, it's not like a, it's not a fast. You are eating at least three meals and I believe two snacks a day. Um, maybe throughout this cleanse, you start to attached to like, oh, wow, I felt really good eating more of these whole foods, less processed foods, less caffeine, um, no alcohol. And you start to incorporate that into your life after the cleanse, you will for sure have body composition benefits, right? Your body composition will change. Um, I would say the emotional benefits go along with mood, right? But if we go back, let's see, watch now, I'll be stuck here. There we go. Come on. Um, we'll go here. I can't, I can't access the, oh, there we go. I can just move that. There we go. Okay. So here's a PDF of the plan. And Shayla, I forget if you are, oh, this one's not working, of course. So I'll have to re relink this. But in this, in this plan, she lists your complete grocery list. She provides recipes for everything that she's recommending to be eating. So let's see here. I'll just kind of show you from here. But, and again, this will be a PDF linked in the, um, in the email I send out after class. But she provides with you a full grocery store list, okay? Tells you how to prep for it recommends that you should prep prior to starting your cleanse so that you have the four days worth of meals already set for you. Um, some of the things that you'll be having, 
fruit salad, liver cleansing medley. Um, you'll be having grains. You'll have some protein. If you're vegan or vegetarian, she offers, um, you know, the appropriate substitutes for, for you. Um, you kind of work, I believe all dinners around this large pot of soup and you'll be having um, a bunch of greens as well. So we've got like a quick veggie soup, a mun bean soup. We already talked about the fruit salad, a bok choy salad, there's a bunch anyways. So she gives you all these recipes, okay? Cleanse enhancers, so you've got a green drink and then an immune booster. But then she breaks it down into each day of, of, your, of your cleanse, right? So you've got your breakfast or early morning snack and or you've got lunch, you've got your mid-afternoon snack and dinner. So again, you're eating plenty throughout the day. Minimalist Baker said she was never hungry throughout this cleanse. So there's that. Um, she also offers you some journaling prompts, which I think are super, super helpful. And that's all I'm going to say on that because I don't want to like copy her. And if you want to get into it, you'll have a link here to be able to check it out. Um, it's important to know that it is recommended that you only do the cleanse during your follicular or ovulatory phase. Okay. When our metabolisms are a little bit slower. Um, that's going to help us to just not be as ravenous. If you did this right before your bleed, you'd probably want to kill somebody. <laughs> I don't know though. There is quite a bit of food there. Um, but um, we require less calories during follicular and ovulatory phases. So that would be a good time to incorporate this. Okay. Um, in terms of things to think about, right? I want us to be going through, like taking a moment even like now or sometime soon and journaling out what parts of your elimination system do you feel intuitively, do you feel are congested? And then do you have support of that, right? Are there signs that would lead to that being in agreement that, okay, that is the area that is congested. Then writing out what things you can focus on based on these slides right here. What things can you focus on to help support yourself? Are you getting enough of the micronutri micronutrients to support that organ? If not, how can you start to incorporate them? Okay. Um, I would love if we're not dry brushing to go ahead and start implementing that practice. Um, and I'm going to commit to trying to do more cold exposure therapy in my showers. I hate cold showers. I hate, I would so much rather get into an ice bath any day than stand in the shower and turn it to cold. But I'm going to try to incorporate that at least for the next week for sure. Um, to see if I notice a difference in anything. Cause I know that I don't, I just take a really hot shower. So I'm going to try to incorporate that myself, but incorporate something that you've learned through today's lecture throughout the next week, right? Again, whether it's increasing various nutrients, I want us to all be doing a bit of journal prompt, right? Of, of what do I intuitively feel is a bit congested researching through here, through our lecture notes, how can I support that organ and, and put it into practice for the week, okay? Um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. If you are watching uh, the recording, please reach out with any questions that you may have. This again will be sent to you in an email. I will make sure that this PDF is linked. Um, as well as these other two things. I'll probably just link them directly in, in the email as well. But uh, please reach out with any questions. And next week, we are going to be talking about how do we apply this all to life? Like how do we, this is a fun one. How do we partake in life uh, and 
like when life happens, say family visits, or we drink too much, or we overindulge, what do we do? Because it's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. Um, so I think this next, this next lecture is, is a fun one because it just makes it all more real, right? We're not gonna be perfect um, and we shouldn't be perfect. Again, the point of all of this is to build awareness and to be our own healers right? To recognize when something in our body is not working the way that it should be and to know the direct path of how to actually heal it, not just put a bandaid on it, but to really truly heal it. And sometimes it takes a couple cycles because we slip back into comfort, into what we know, right? So yeah, that's that. I'm going to end the recording. And I will see you next week. Shayla, stay on if you have any questions. Let's go here. All right.